are so sorry about all of that. Um, so Mr. Tebum could not be here today. So John, our vice chair, is going to get to step up and chair the meeting for us. So I'll make it back. Don't worry. <laughs> so do you have the agenda? So you I do. Okay, good. Okay, I turn it over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the, this is the second meeting of this school year, and the principal focus that we want to get uh, grounded on is the small business enterprise policy that's coming on. Uh, we've got some work to catch up on uh, from the last meeting, um, and so what I'd like to do is, uh, first before we go too far, is uh, welcome Ms. Gittins to our group. Um, she, I think, as we all heard last time, is the new board representative to this uh, group, and we welcome you. Uh, Thanks, you were sir. here two years ago for a day. Mm -hmm. I guess we didn't scare you <laughs> off. Uh, it was way too much. Later. <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate it, and thank you so much, and especially to those of you online. Hey, I don't know which way the camera's going. <laughs> um, and I apologize for missing the first meeting. We had a family situation, so I wasn't able to be here, but I have uh, looked at everything and studied, and hopefully I can uh, be of help as a liaison between the board and finance. It's a very, very important committee that we have. So you all are very important. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking your time. Can I ask a question? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Who, who puts the agenda together? And is that Kelly and Barb? So we, yes, we put the agenda together based on the conversations that we have in the meetings. Yeah, I, I don't remember anything about small business enterprise policy. Um, I talked about when we um, were the, picking the ones that we okay. wanted to do, we said budget first. I said that we had the uh, procurement that wanted to present the small oh, okay. business, and they would, be, yeah. they would do that first, and it would be... I think you said you needed 15 minutes, so, right? Yeah. And we, uh, we asked to come. Yes. We, were, we have this initiative that we're, um, we've been to several board advisory committees um, talking about, so mm -hmm. we did ask to come and be on your agenda sometime. Thank you. Welcome. And uh, we're going to talk in a second. I think before we go further, um, are there any questions or any issues with the minutes from the last meeting? Yeah, I don't know. No, it was unanimously approved. I didn't vote on it because I wasn't there for that meeting. So I didn't feel like I could vote yes or no because I had no idea what was on that meeting. So I, I don't know. It was know. unanimous for those that vote. Right. Well, was I, was on, I was on the video, but I did not vote. Vote. Oh. Yes. I'm sorry. I thought you could. Yeah. So I, you know, it's it, it, right. I didn't feel right voting because I wasn't at the April meeting. Got it. Got it. And I think anybody that was new, I, I find it hard to believe they could vote on the minutes if they weren't there. But okay. that's okay. just me. Well, I'll, I'll change that. I apologize. Thanks. Do I have a motion to approve? Sub pending the Something. seconded. I second. The meeting minutes are approved. Um, you want to take a vote? Aye. 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 Everybody on Zoom, raise your if you're okay, Zoom. you'll raise your hand. Okay. John? Okay. His hand's up. Okay. No, that's, that's mine. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> uh, we have two that we don't see the picture. Okay, Kenny's up. John, are you okay? Yes, I'm good. I'm okay. trying to figure out where it's at. Good, thank you. Take out a little. Can you all still hear me if I do that? Yes, you can still hear me okay? Okay, good. Trying to keep the background noise down. Okay. Okay. Is there any public comment? Anyone from outside the group that would... It does not look like there is anyone for that, uh, that aspect. So um, sliding right through the agenda, the next part is uh, Ms. Giddens. 
Again, as I said, welcome to the group. If you don't mind, I'm going to break from the agenda for a second. Since you don't know any of us, I thought if we all spent no more than 30 seconds to say who we are, where we're from, okay. well, I don't think you'll remember it all. You'll at least get a sense yeah, for this we'll meeting. Yeah, <laughs> 20 people in uh, five yeah. minutes, yes. <laughs> so, my name is John Shannon. <laughs> uh, my name is John Shannon. I'm a retired executive from DuPont, and I've lived here in Fort Myers for six years, and I have a son at Fort Myers High School. And what district are you representing? Uh, South. Okay. Very good. Thank you. I'm Ken Boyd. Um, I've been on the committee. This is going to be my sixth year. Um, I went. I spent about 20 years in banking in New York and uh, worked for Cargill for a number of years as a CFO, one of their subsidiaries. And then I came here and started my own company about 20 years ago. So we run an IT technology firm here in Fort Myers. Right. Got two boys there in college and one's out. And, uh, okay. yeah. Very good. What bank? Which bank? I was started at Chase and then I was at uh, Bank of America. Bank of America. Are you in banking? 13 no. years. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, great. Yes. Hello, I'm Chelsea Seabauer. I'm a financial controller at a local medical organization. I've got two children in Lee County School District. One's in eighth grade. The other is in fourth grade. We reside within the, the west zone of Cape Coral School District. Oh, okay. I'm Mark Nowitzki. I'm retired. Spent the uh, better part of my life working in DOD Finance Department of Defense. Retired out of the Pentagon. Been retired about 10 years. I live in the South Zone and um, did financial analysis for a living. Very good. And I'm Mary Watford. I'm retired from the Department of Education. I administer the Southern County area in Florida. And uh, my children actually went through the Lee County Schools till they graduated. Mm -hmm. They're adults now. So, thank you for letting us have them. <laughs> okay. And on the mic, do we want yeah. to? Uh, my name is Kenny Jenkins. I'm a uh, regional manager for Snow the Spain uh, Small Business and Consumer Banking. Uh, I have an eight year old, a five year old, and a two, a two year old who will soon be in the Lee County School District. Yeah. And I was born and raised here. I decided to come back after finishing college because my wife forced me to. Alina? <laughs> yes, hi. My name is Eliana Phillips. Uh, I think it's my third year. Um, I have quite an extensive career in consulting and in finance, and I have a elementary school students in, in the district. Thank you, John. Hi, my name is John Boder. I'm with the Lee County Tax Collector's Office as a Chief Operating Officer. Um, been in Lee County for uh, coming up on two years now. I have um, four children, um, two of which are at the Young Game School and the two that are at uh, Red Sea Bay Thank you. Diana? Hi, I am Diana Alzuris. Um, I'm a local realtor. I have been in Southwest Florida pretty much my entire life. I went through um, Lee County Schools. Uh, I'm one of five children, and all of us did. Um, and I don't have any kids myself, but I have worked closely with um, children. I've worked in mental health and also um, the arts. Thank you. And is it Jesse? Jess? Uh, yeah, Jesse Miguel. I'm a financial advisor with Mental advisors. Um, I have three children in the Lee County School System in kindergarten, first grade, and third grade, um, and also involved with a um, couple of churches in Southwest Florida. Thank you. Thank you. And then in the meeting, just so you know, um, Tracy Adams is our director of procurement. Um, she will be one of the presenters, as well as Susan Millay is our executive director for business services. And uh, Dr. Amy Desimore is here. She's the chief financial officer. Okay. Well, I'm, thank you so much. And, and thank you all again for your service to students. 
Um, basically, I one of the things I want to ask you is, and with the mask on, can you all on the screen, can you understand and hear me? Is it clear? Okay. If not, just let me know. I can drop it down for a minute. I, I mean, there's a lot I could tell you about what we're doing, but I don't think you want to know all of that. So, I would kind of like to know, and I will give you a few details, but I'd kind of like to know what are the things that you want me to bring to talk about when I come um, as liaison for the board. Um, basically, just the the financial and the capital things, or um, what kind of thoughts and ideas would you want to hear? Impact fees and proportionate share. Okay, all right. So let me do this for the first, just a minute or so. Are there any questions that anyone has? And I will tell you, I'll answer what I can and what I can't, I will say I can't. So are there any questions at all of anything that you may have thought? Ken, you look like you got a question under the mask. No, well, I, I think it'd be helpful to, I mean, I don't have a problem if you want to just give us sort of the hot buttons that you guys are talking about in between our meetings, you know, because we don't all follow it that closely. I don't anyway. <laughs> You're blessed. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I know there's things that come up, you know, that become sort of front and, front and center, you know, between the meetings. So it helps yeah. me just to get an update on it. Okay. All right. Any other specifics? I think similarly, you know, I'm in the same place as okay. Ken. The other thing, it was just because it was raised back in the spring, you know, I know Dave LaRose is working on a project for booster clubs. I'm the treasurer of the band boosters at Fort Myers High. Mm -hmm. My wife's the president of the vocal arts boosters um, at the same, you know, at Fort Myers High. And so, and I know that there was a lot of stuff that was proposed in that, some financial, some not financial. Right. But it also provided some perspective on how the district wanted to work with and was, related organizations. Okay, and and regarding that, and you can back me up, but there were um, there was training that was done, and I know our board uh, attorney and Mr. Larosa and a team went out to all the different schools and the boosters to lay out exactly mm -hmm. these are the rules, these are the laws, this is what we need. Excuse me, the issue that came up a year or so ago. Um, about booster clubs, part of it was the lack of training. And so that's why we were fixing that by actually providing training for um, all of the booster clubs that are out there, all the finance and everything else. And if, Dr. Decimal, you have anything to add to about the booster club issue? Uh, no, just that, you know, it's, it's new and in progress. We kind of revamped the um, manual that we had to have for quite some time, revamped it, revamped training, and, um, you know, trying our best to reach everybody just to be able to keep um, as, as, you know, as much oversight for, you know, all the people who are responsible for those organizations that they have the tools that they need um, to be able to provide oversight for their respective committees. It appears from the internal audit comments that were on the website, the school district website, that there's still problems with that. That, a, a, you know, a percentage anywhere between 10 and 20 percent of the schools have problems with funds like that booster, you know, clubs, the whole bit. So the training was trying to get that down to a lower level. Yeah. So yeah. Do we have any metrics that we the training was successful. Uh, well, just started. Okay. You know, this school year. Okay. So not as of yet. All right. So that, that'll be in the future. Ms. Gittins, the, the other question I have is, do, do we have a roadmap of how they put the next year budget together? So in, in March, are we throwing out to the departments? And in April, it comes to Dr. Desimori. In, mm -hmm. in May, it comes to the school board, whatever that is, because it's great that we're going over this year budget that we're already in the first 90 days. Mm -hmm. But our, I think our goal should be to affect what's next year's budget, where if we see an issue this year, we need to correct it next year, not have somebody explain why they did it after it was already done. 
Well, here's so the budget is, development, I guess, is the word. I'm and, and they definitely have a schedule okay. uh, as to when it goes here and when it goes to the public and when we review it and all of that. So it, uh, one of the things that I was thinking about and actually going to, br going to bring up to the rest of the board is with the advisory board's uh, suggestion I have at the beginning of the year or you know, maybe in August, because usually depending on how school starts, to have the first meeting of, the, of our advisory boards to be a little bit elongated, and at those meetings to have the, um, you know, the training for sunshine that we do, and also an overview of each group. Say it's curriculum, then curriculum would present, the, the staff would present this is what we just completed. This is kind of an overview of what we'll need in the next year so that each group can be thinking about these are our major issues. These are our major challenges and things like that. And there's a possibility of doing that as a whole with all of the, like a workshop with all of the, uh, uh, you know, representatives in the board and everybody together to kind of just go through that. Or, um, or doing a longer meeting individually. And, and uh, I don't know what you guys would think about doing that because you talk about a roadmap. Mm -hmm. You give us an opportunity to say, and especially new people, you know, you've got new folks that are on. And not that we start from square one each time, but coming on as a refresher. Here's what we completed last year. And here's where we're headed this year. Here's some of the things. So I'd really like to get some feedback on that and what you all mm -hmm. think about it, and staff too. And I, um, I think it's a wonderful idea. Um, some of us have had terms before. Mm -hmm. And so we may be kind of um, at different levels. Right, right. Um, and I, I was thinking it would really be great if the new members would have an opportunity to kind of have a more thorough orientation. Okay. Um, but I do recognize we're a team, so we have to bring the people who have been here on. Well, maybe the, the more seasoned ones can help to put that presentation on. In other words, to help and say some of the roadblocks that they may have seen to help new ones coming on. And unfortunately, we don't have the time, you know, necessarily to just retrain and retrain every mm -hmm. year. But how can we how can we fix that issue? But what do you think about the idea? I like the idea as a new member. I like the idea of a combined um, meeting where we've got perspectives of other either committees or the board itself because the primary role of the Finance Advisory Committee is the purpose is to provide input, advice, and support in the preparation of the budget, which is looking you know, prospective. And so I think in order to do that, obviously uh, it's not the objective of the committee to sit here and discuss um, what the board should or not, should not do, right. but we should be educated in that because we need to have that perspective in order to provide advice from a finance perspective as to where we should or should not go in the budget. And I think that, you know, we talk about the time. I think really that's something that should probably occur annually mm -hmm. at minimum, regardless of whether they're seasoned or unseasoned, because it provides perspective as to the primary initiatives of the board. Um, related to children and student achievement. And that's that's excellent because actually, when I look at each advisory, they all still intertwine. You know, finance intertwines with curriculum and this and that, and curriculum intertwines with everything else as well. So we're all kind of intertwined and to hear what everyone else is working on. I don't know if we have enough of that. Because you know each advisory tends to be an island on its own, so that's why I'm thinking that maybe we can have something in the beginning of uh, a one day event or something where we are half a day those that can come in and maybe everyone from the each committee can't make it, 
but enough of them would be there and it would be video so you know they'd be able to go back and say what is it i'm really supposed to be looking at you know this year mm -hmm. so that was why i had that Let, go ahead i was going to say i think that's um, <clears throat> the concept is a really good one you know, figuring out how to make it work effectively Oh, that's out of staff. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's fine. I've been thinking of district advisory that's over 100 members. I'm and, on that too. So. Yeah. So <laughs> it's like, okay, with them, with everybody else. It, well, maybe we can figure out representative, but that's where we need to think about yeah. the logistics of it. If it's a workshop in the boardroom, then anybody that can come, the boardroom is open, and, you know, yeah. how, how many, I don't know how many it holds, but. Mm -hmm. um, the sign outside of it says 100, 200, and 200. Yeah, something. something like that. Yeah. And we won't get everybody from every group, but at least it would be representative. So, anyway, it's a thought. Thank you for your input on that. All, all the high schools have an auditorium, and they see well over 200 in there, too. So, right. if we wander around and maybe a little we bit. we need to do it in different locations. That, that's something else that has come up. Know where we need them now, but then we end up with the technology as well. Wow. <laughs> I don't know why we said no. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so I would like to suggest that prior to our meetings, usually uh, we, we were then one or two weeks of a board meeting. So I would suggest that each of you would go on to. Um, Board docs, and you know how to get to that through Lee. Uh, if anybody doesn't, we can show you. You can go through leeschools.net, leadership, and all that. But on board docs, if you would pull up the most recent action meeting prior to our meeting, then that gives you, um, I don't know if you know, do you have control? Mm -hmm. To pull that out, just to pull up the agenda for uh, yesterday's six o'clock. And when you go in there, there are also, um, you're not getting into them, are you? <laughs> 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 um, um, normally, finance and capital and all that, we have those once a month updates. So to look on there and see some of the things and maybe put down some questions you might have, that's the best to me review for you guys to say, okay, so why did they do this? Why did they spend this amount? And if you have all the different eyes on it, then you have your questions and we can come and they can answer, well, this happened because of this. Do, do they actually show, I'm sorry, do they show the actual income and expenses against the budget at those meetings because uh, that's the piece of if we don't know tell us the actuals now for last year is kind of uneventful it, you, you've got to be doing actuals quarterly so maybe at the november meeting here we could talk about the actual costs either expenses and, and revenues so we can see where we are on track. I mean, well, monthly, monthly there's a report that goes to the board. Right. Okay. Monthly, a monthly budget report. Can we get that? It's not that? necessarily presented aloud, but it is right. um, part of their agenda that they approve each month. Okay. And it would be on here. It's publicly okay. available for any, anyone okay. to access. Yes. Yeah, the website is tough to find stuff. Yeah. Well, you know what? What I will make sure we do is if we pull it up. We can send you the link that will take you pretty much right to Board Docs. Okay. And then when you're on Board Docs, like, see how it has featured and agenda mm -hmm. and all that. If you click on Meetings, and then it gives you all the meetings there. The 6 o'clock is the one we had yesterday. That's when we do the action item. Now, if you want to go before that in our briefings and all, then that's going to show going to show you the reports that Dr. Desimore, uh, okay. Susan Malay, you know, any of them present, and it would be in more detail. So the briefings would, would be more like that. But as you, sorry, oh, that's all right. I should, can you all see what I'm presenting on the Zoom? That's what I'm trying to figure Did out. Did you share your screen? I have to figure out how to 
At the bottom, the green thing that says share screen. This is getting I know. Yeah. Yeah. Which one was it? Okay. There we go. Okay. And now everybody can see that now we're on the site. Okay. So, um, for example, you can click on the, the work plan facilities and all that. This is just showing some of the detail that we would have. It's coming up. It's <laughs> and then at the top you can make it bigger where it says plus. Oh wait, there you go. There we go. Yay. Okay. So this gives you what we get once a month. These are some of the the details and all of that. And I don't know how deep you guys want to go into it, but it's all here for you to see exactly what it is we're working. So the place to go would be board docs to look at it ahead of time to see if there are any questions or anything that you want to bring about why something was done. Um, a quick observation that if you were going to have an annual meeting, it'd be great to just walk through and say, we're emailing you the link, here's board docs, here's where you navigate on the website. Yes. Because you know we are a huge school district and there's a ton of information, but unless you know how to get to it, it's a little difficult to just walk in through. Here's where the budget books are for the past 20 years online. Here's where the audit reports are for the past 10 years online. And then here are the reports for the past year of everything that was um, reviewed and presented to the board. And that's an excellent thing to, have to add that to it. And that would be for the whole group to let them know, you know, when you're looking for your portion of what's happening with the board. So anyway, this I wanted to steer you guys to this. I'm not going to go through all of the details of it. Um, anytime you want to find out something, though, I would steer you to board docs. And Susan, can you go back to it one more time and let me show them how to find what they're looking for real quick? Okay. Because there's a way that once you get in there, you can click on, I'm sorry, I didn't know before you got out. Once you get in there, you can click on, I believe it's library, and it'll give you a whole, this is, yeah, that's the wrong way to get in. I hate that there's so many steps, guys, but. <laughs> this is a complicated. That, Design. Is, yes. that is. But when we send it to you, we'll send you the one where you can just go click, click, and then you're there. Is okay, the, click the, on the library, just general. Uh, is that it? And then there's a search library. There's a right search library. Features. That's what I was looking Yeah, right. Under the word features. Under yeah. features. No, well, I'm sorry, there's two features for that. On the left side. Oh, under library. Yep, yeah, here. Under the, yep, yeah, right there. Yes. yes. Okay, right there. When you go into library and that shows up, <clears throat> that's a search field right there. Just put in finance reports or something. Let's see budget. Put okay. budget schedule in. Let's see if that's in there. Um, okay. There's a different one too where it shows you all over that. What? There's in a, the meetings itself. There you yeah, go. I think it's, it's, it's in meetings. Yeah. Yeah. So now here's the meetings. Now you can search all meetings. Exactly. Yeah. Agendas and stuff. And this shows you everything where we've talked about budget. So you know, if you were in curriculum, you could put in curriculum and see every time we talked about curriculum. But this is something that, you know, you can play around with, ask us if you need any help. But if you're thinking, well, what happened last year in August when we were looking at budget? What was that final budget looking like? Then you could go here and look at August and see what comes up. So yeah. just a tool to help you. Um, understand uh, what's going on and hopefully that would be really helpful. I, 
in I appreciate that. It, it's, you know, I guess the one question that's if there is, there's a, well, you know, maybe this is a conversation for offline is how deep do you go? I mean, we, we sort of look, or we have traditionally looked, this is a, I'm going to pick transportation just because mm -hmm. I had a conversation. What are we doing? How are we doing it? What can we do to make it better? Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of conversation, getting into where we've been, uh, you know, and looking backwards, I think is important, but it has to be done as the baseline for where we're going. For where we're going, exactly. Mm -hmm. And you could, it, like on budget, you could put in that search field transportation budget. Mm -hmm. If the topic that we're discussing at the next meeting is about transportation budget, and you're wondering, well, what have we done with that? Mm -hmm. You can put in your transportation okay. budget. And it's under the CPR. It's in um, media one and two. Stay <laughs> down. Um, yeah. So at least, I mean, and you can narrow it down. So if we're talking sure. about hey, curriculum budget, budget, you can put that in and be able to see exactly and answer some of your questions. So I'm just trying to give you some resources um, to kind of help you understand where we're at and what your jobs could be. But the budget has to be approved by the board before the 1st of July. Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. No? No. I'm sorry. I thought it was. I'm sorry. The budget has to be approved before the start of the fiscal year? Yeah. Um, no. No. The fiscal really? year, no, we don't, we don't even receive the state budget until May. And then um, in June, the board does a preliminary approval of the budget based on the information that we have. In July, you know, the year starts on July 1st, so July 30 or right around July 28th or something, they do a tentative budget hearing where they approve the millage rates and things like that. They go out to the taxpayers, and then in September, the first part of September, the final budget is approved. So they only do a preliminary approval prior to the fiscal year starting because the legislative session doesn't start till March, so there's no way they have the information to us in time to prepare the budget. And we don't get the second calculation, which gives us the millage rates and stuff for them to take out until June. And then you have the federal money coming down. The federal mm -hmm. comes all year long in and out. Yeah, and then you have to the project. Tax. We project yeah. for federal and go through that process, yes. All right, so you do have a schedule or a calendar. Can we share that? Share that? Okay. that down to make sure to share with you okay. when we start the budget discussions. Well, now I understand why I couldn't get a copy of the budget in August because it's not done. <laughs> it's not ready yet. Yeah, Even though the fiscal stuff like, we do is kind of. Yeah. When this happens, then we can do this. I mean, it's like the tax running when the first asset tax uh, payment came through, it was approved, but then we didn't receive it until months what, later. months like, later. Three months, I think. Yeah. So the, the fiscal year is fixed because you want it to align with the school year. Our fiscal year. You know, the federal government the moved theirs from July to 1 October mm -hmm. just because of that, you know, because of other things. So. Mm -hmm. You probably have to do a tentative, don't you? Or you project what you're going to get. We, we project. And then adjust yes. and get less or more. Yes, so we start in February with the department budgets. The school stuff we take, we send out before that, February, we work with the department okay. and start building the budget at that time with some preliminary information with our projections and things like that. We're trying, <coughs> the, the legislative session starts in March. We start gathering information like what's it what's sure. going on what's happening and we start making some assumptions as we're going to that point and then in may the first part of may is when we are supposed to have our actual first calculation which is at that point just an estimated um, tax amount and then in june we get the actual tax amount from um, the department of revenue and the department of education where they've adjusted the budget based on that and that's why in june we do the preliminary with the board right after we get that and then july is our tentative budget hearing which is basically just any you know sure. kind of tweaking everything and then September is the final after the tax notices have all gone out everything. So in May and June is our shot to really put something in that doesn't make sense to us. 
that's the time to bring it up. And during the course of the year, we need to be sure. Mm -hmm. So be before we go up and we have some guests right, here, right, right. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, can I make a suggestion that Kelly, you know, I look to you, maybe one or two others, kind of look at with other groups what might be a good way to enhance the underlying understanding of what the processes are. You know, is there a two-hour meeting or something that helps us understand it to you know, Miss Ms. Gittins' and I will work with suggestion you putting that uh, there. That we can present to everyone. That clearly is much bigger than this particular group right. here yeah. right now. Um, but it depends yeah. on the land. Oh, questions. absolutely. No. Um, and basically, everything else is kind of, we are you know, building schools, we are educating students, we are working on achievement gap. Um, COVID has been a real bad hit on achievement gap, and it's causing us to have to, you know, play catch up. Uh, and we're making some games, and it kind of took us back. So there's a lot of challenges that we're working on at this point, and uh, we're moving along. And if you guys want my my email is out there, GwinnettaSG at leadschools.net, and even if there's something that's not to do with the committee, you have a question, please feel free to email me or call me at any time. And that's G W Y N E T T A S G at leeschools.net. And I think that's it, unless anyone has any questions. Anyone online have questions? Anyone on Zoom with questions, comments? Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd like to transition to the presentation okay. on the uh, small business enterprise policy. And I believe everyone received the charts um, via email. I had printed some for those in attendance view and had been sent it, so I don't send copies. Okay. Okay. I got you it. Would, like a copy? mm -hmm. would you like one? Yes, please. No, I have one. Okay. Gwen, mm -hmm. do you want one? Sure. Yes. Yeah, okay. Alright, thank you. 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 Alright, Whatever welcome. Uh, I think Mary, do you need? Thank you. Thank you for handing them out. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Oh, that part. Yeah, I'm happy. All right, before we go, the time. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, my name is Susan Millay. I'm the executive director of Business Services, and I'd like to have uh, Tracy and Amy also introduce themselves. Tracy, please come on. Kelly, can you mute? Can you mute yourself, Kelly? I don't know if Susan's. Yeah, yeah, I have a little bit of hard time hearing the presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Is that better? Okay, can y'all hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes, we can. Okay, my name is Tracy Adams. I'm the procurement director. Hi, and hello, I'm Amy Bessemore, and I am the uh, chief financial officer. And I can't hear anybody if you guys are. <laughs> Okay, so how are we going to ca capture? I've muted myself. No, we can, oh, we can, I can okay. hear you. Go ahead. Okay. So everybody can hear me if I can get a thumbs up. Okay, thank you. Yes. All right, so um, we're going to launch right into it. Um, the school district is has been evaluating the opportunity for a small business enterprise program, and this fall we are rolling out to many of our advisory committees 
to um, further explain what the board has been briefed on and what the recommended action is. So we're here today to talk about the who, what, where, what, and why of a small business program for the school district. Um, the, the goal of a small business program would be to increase uh, small business participation with, PAC, with district dollars. So we want to increase the number of contracts that go to small businesses in our community. Um, an option would be if we establish this program, we would be able to award um, uh, competitive uh, contracts that are specifically targeted for businesses of a certain size. So that is, you, you would qualify as a small business, and then you would be able to um, compete for that. Kelly, I've been, I've been asked to mute mine. Let me see if I mute. If you can, if they can still hear you. Okay, go ahead. So Kelly has muted, and I'm talking. Tracy, can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? The okay. Susan, you just need to unmute. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So now, Tracy, can you hear me? We were able to hear you before, and now we can't for some reason. Okay. So, um, so why don't you mute yourself? Okay. And then, and then turn your turn speaker, your speaker off. So, um, okay. So I am unmuted. I'm muted on Zoom and my speaker is turned to zero. Can you all hear her now? Yeah, no, I think we're just hearing her, your speaker, Kelly. Okay, so how about if I unmute on Zoom and you mute on Zoom? That's what we were doing today. Okay, I did not okay. unmute. I did not unmute on Zoom. Remember, were you muted? Turn up the volume on my computer. Ah, uh, yes, that was the laptop that is projected and need to change it on. Okay, Jesse, I can see you clearly. Can you hear me? Can you give me a thumbs up, Jesse? Yes and no. So now I'm going to turn my volume up. Did you turn that one off? Jesse, are you able to hear me? If so, can you give me a thumbs up? I'm kind of thinking that one should be up and you guys should both be off. Is that, is that picking up back there as well? Mute yours. Unmute it. Can you all hear me now? Your sound is still on. No, I turned it down now. Can you all hear us? I see it. Oh, thumbs up. Okay, as soon as you want to start talking. So your volume, Kelly, should your uh, everyone is picking up my voice on Kelly's computer. And mm -hmm. so I think now we have it figured out where we've only got four devices <laughs> for voice projection. All right, so we are ready to roll. Jesse, can you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? All right, we did it, guys. Yay. All right, so back to uh, um, who, what, where, when, and why. Okay, so we're looking at small business program for local businesses. <laughs> and um, we're with the goal to increase um, business uh, uh, dollars from the school district going to local small businesses and potentially awarding them contracts specifically geared to um, small business entities and we will um, as we do with all of our committees we would the board we would uh, the board would establish a uh, committee membership and um, they would help us decide the size decide the size of the corporation and that might be defined by revenue and it might be defined by number of um, employees So a little bit more about the criteria and the difference between a small business program and a minority or disadvantaged business program. 
Many of you are probably familiar with the, the federal and state programs that have standards established. For the small businesses, they rest again on um, dollars or number of employees. They, that um, awarding contracts to a small business does not require a disparity study. And that is currently the model we are pursuing is the Small Business Enterprise Program. A minority or disadvantaged business program would require a disparity study to assess the percentage of minority firms in the community, the percentage of, my, uh, of spend with those minority firms to determine if a balancing act is required to increase that participation. Any questions on that so far? Who does the, <laughs> who does the disparity study? Do we, or do they have to come to us? A it consultant. That it would be a consultant that we would hire that would conduct that disparity study. So for each business that comes in, that, or that wants to do business with us, they would have to go through that? Um, no, it'd be an overall disparity study for, oh. you know, for the, for oh, for the, the district and the community oh, right? okay. to okay. determine. So it wouldn't be a case by case basis. It would be one okay. that the consultant would do based on the, in, the information of who we do business with and who's available in our community to do business with. But so, they would have to say there, I mean, show that they're either to, to get in under the minority disadvantage, they have to either be a minority, a woman, a veteran, and right. all of that. Okay. Right. Any other questions? All right. Um, drivers for establishing the program are that um, this would uh, invigorate the community by creating jobs, fostering economic growth, um, increasing engagement with our local business partners, and also, importantly to the district, increasing competition. So as we have more uh, community members um, educated on how to bid with the district, they have a greater opportunity to win, which increases competition. It also grows the pool of subcontractors available for the large contracting firms that, for example, are building schools. So um, a, a vast majority of small businesses are in the construction industry. So we believe that, and studies have shown that this would stimulate um, qualified candidates so that subcontractors would have a greater local pool, to, pool of candidates to pull from. Would you require a construction contract to have so many minority or small businesses? That is a great question and yes, um, as we get into the implementation, we'll talk exactly about that, is how we work, the plan would work with a small business and with large, large business and how we would set those up. So no, no, I'm, I'm talking about in the contract, when you go out with the RFP, you would say, in your proposal, you need to propose 20% small business and 20% minority owned businesses. Yes, that's what that's uh, So yes. you're redoing the RFP process yes. also in this, okay. Yes. All right, do you see any problem with the E-Verify? Mm, no, we use E-Verify now. Okay, we're, as our community district, we're having problems with companies because they don't want to e-verify. Mm -hmm. So it's that's... It's a requirement for the district to require that. Okay. So we don't have an option there. Well, I understand that we just, I think you're going to eliminate some people because they don't want to do it. So, okay. Good point. Other questions? All right. So another major driver for this is, um, you may remember 2018, the community passed the um, sales tax referendum for uh, generating half cent um, sales tax on sales locally for the school district. We would love to put that money back into our local community. Um, the sales tax referendum listed four categories of um, investments that the sales tax may be spent on, and those are listed there for you to see. And so. Um, as you were talking about, what do we want to look at as a finance advisory committee? I would recommend that through our main district website, you can see the sales tax dashboard that tracks all monies to all school and all projects by these four categories. So I think that's a hot spot for the finance advisory committee. And um, we think that this plays right into that sales tax being reinvested into this program. Can we add that to our resource list? that we will give to everyone is to make them click and get that. Yeah. That is a one click from the homepage, the district homepage. You go to leaseschools.net, about two thirds of the way down, there's a sales tax dashboard button. That's a really easy to get to. Um, 
um, which is great. Um, so some of the questions, oh, I see some things in the chat. Are those new, Kelly? Are you monitoring that? I don't yeah, know. No, there's no, no, no questions. Chat. Okay. So. All right. Um, historically, just wanted to share a few of the things that um, the procurement department has done to engage with uh, local small and minority businesses. Um, one of the most important things is that we collect regularly or uh, pull down regularly the state and the county list of registered certified firms who are a small and minority businesses. So we have that data. And when we go out to bid, we um, contact the vendors that are registered uh, minority businesses and notify them of district bids. So we've been doing that for many years. And um, um, we also, I think one of the funnest or coolest things that we do is the matchmaking program. So since we started constructing schools um, it recently, we've had an open house where we invite the vendors in who want to do business on the school construction and the large prime contractors who are awarded. It's a meet and greet. They get to interview, submit their qualifications and meet the um, small businesses so that then when it comes time to submit their bids to the prime contractors, they've had an opportunity to meet, they understand what needs to be submitted. And so that would increase engagement uh, between the small businesses and the large. During the process of evaluating how we're gonna uh, launch this um, small business enterprise policy and program, we've been partnered with the FGCU Small Business Development Consortium um, we have been partnered with them for many years. They participate in our reverse trade shows and they help educate the communities how to submit bids, how to get bonded, how to receive funding uh, when they are taking on uh, government contracts. Um, have you talked to Dr. Kanui from the entrepreneurship program out there? Yes, we have. Okay, because a lot of those people are doing neat things, mm -hmm. and they're definitely small businesses and a lot of technology stuff. Right. So we also meet regularly with uh, Mark O'Dell and uh, Ms. Knox from the two different depart branches of the SBDC. Um, so one is really in, um, assisting people and filling out their paperwork and understanding bids, and one is more presentations, um, gathering and collecting and advertising that and so we, we meet with them and uh, work together. Thanks. All right, so I wanted to take a peek now at the policy. Um, I hope that everybody might have had a chance to review it. Um, the, important, the first step of moving forward with this program would be for the school board to um, conduct two public hearings of, this po of a policy and this is a draft before you. Um, after community feedback from our advisory committee, the policy will be updated with any input that you might have and the other committee members, and then we would present it to the board. Our hope is to present it to the board in November um, for them to adopt or agree to proceed with two hearings that are required to adopt a uh, small business enterprise policy. So if anybody has any questions or feedback on the policy, this would be a great time to have that conversation. I think in deference to the group, but most of us, I think, just got it within the last 30 minutes. Right. Yeah, and I'm wondering. Yeah. Right. Right. So what, can I make a motion that if we have any feedback, we provide it in the next week or 10 days, let's pick a time, feed it back through, Kelly? Yes. No copies to anyone? Right. Direct to Kelly or direct to Barb, and they will provide the feedback on back to you. I said most of us saw this about 30 minutes ago. One of the things that kind of jumps out at me is I, I kind of anticipated to see a line in here that says uh, when we have contracts that are over you know a million dollars, we will set the policy that so much percentage will be small business and minority. So the idea that you're negotiating each contract. You know, it might be 20% one time, might be 15, another time might be 10. I, I think you need to set a threshold for the contracts so they know what the goals are. Because that, that's the incentive then for the prime contractor to go out and hire the subs. Mm -hmm. And I think you need to say that in here. But, right. So the, um, the, the difference, I agree completely with everything you're saying. There's a difference between 
the policy and the program. Okay. So the policy at a high level is what the board adopts, authorizing the establishment of committee to define the standard by which the program will be executed. Okay. So the policy is at the very high level. The board sets policy, then um, the chief financial officer will implement that policy through the program. And so, for example, one of the important things is um, the school board members would invite committee members, they would recommend committees just as they've done on this committee, and then that committee would gather to help define the criteria, what targets do we want to use, how are we defining small, um, some of that will come from the district, some of that will be committee input, and um, so it'll evolve, um, there will be a, a policy adoption, defining the committee, defining the program goals, and then launching of contracts that would have the goals that are defined by the committee and the house and the program. Can I ask if, um, I, I mean, thinking as a board member, if there's anyone on this committee that you know, has the background or expertise or a desire to be a part of that, that you know, to let me know if I can. That's right. great. On every committee we've presented to, I have had multiple people mm -hmm. give me their name afterwards. And what I've done is I've um, directed them to the website where it shows what district they are in and who their board members is and asked that they reach out to their board member expressing an interest. And I also let them know the two at-large board members so that if people are interested, they can reach out to the board member, develop that relationship and explain why they, they would like to be on that committee. And what is the, the longevity of that committee, is it? It hasn't been established yet, so um, I think with our um, standards that we do with all of our committees, I think that, you know, we probably ask Lee will to say, you know, what, what are the terms that we usually use? Do we want to do it anything different? Is the first year? Do we want a two-year commitment? So that is all to be determined. I, I'm still kind of struggling, I'm sorry, between the idea of setting you know, a benchmark or a standard and goals. And, and I'm okay with either one, but I think if you put goals down, you're asking for lawsuits because you didn't have, you know, here's I'm prime contractor and I've got 18%, the goal was 20. Is that okay? If you try to tell me I need to hire 2% more, I'm gonna sue you because it was a goal, it wasn't a standard. So I think you need to be very, very clear the right. difference between standards and goals or you know, there's a floor, you got to hit 20% or you got to hit some percentage. Right. All right, so. I've done a little too much contracting in my life and government contracting, so, sorry. So um, when we, th there are two different categories of um, where we will, where I envision that we would um, provide uh, standards that we're shooting for. One would be identifying contracts that we want to set out exclusively for small businesses. So that's one bucket, and that's for them to become the prime contractors and develop them in doing business with the government, doing business with the district. The second is when we have major school new school construction, we already have in our contracts minority business goals. As we have gone through the legal evaluation process, we have determined that the cost and the time involved for minority businesses would take a, a lot longer. So we want to start small business because no disparity study is required. And so we are going to adapt our uh, large contracts to focus on uh, targets or required percentages in contracts for small businesses. So again, that will be discussed by the committee that's defining the standards that will go into the contract. So um, we'll, we'll, I think you, know, you might want to consider joining that team with the expertise that you have. My wife was going to make me cancel something else to get on that one. So <laughs> I had to give up something to get on this one. So I, yeah. if you want to talk to my wife here, I, I'll, I'll give you a But we get your point, though, and I have that noted. Okay. It, it basically is about um, the, like a consequence, right? Is, it, is this a requirement, or right. is this what right. you're asking me to strive yeah, for? Yeah. Right? So I understand what you're saying right. okay. so that we can lay that out clear. Sure. Right? Yes. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And, and just by the way, we're already developing the requirements for that reporting. So anytime there's a request for pay, there's a request, uh, they're required to report what percent of that labor went to what business and what what dollar amount and what was the percentage of that trade. So those, those things are 
um, in the works already. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, at this point, um, I think that we said that we're going to um, have feedback maybe within the week, if today's Wednesday, if maybe by next Wednesday, any feedback you can have by reviewing the policy and making recommendations to it. We'd love to have that so that I can get it into the policy update before it goes to the board when we're targeting that November 2nd. So I would be um, acting on your input right away. Thank you. And I just sent the policy out to everybody, um, so you should have it now. Right now. All right, so the question is now, how are we going to do this? What are the steps? Number one is the community engagement, which is what we're doing right now with your involvement and um, many others. And there will be the adoption of the policy and then developing the uh, administrative procedures. The school board would take its first um, framework to the committee and the, frame, the committee would hash that out. Um, we would identify what businesses, what con specific contracts do we think are right for bidding locally with small businesses being primes. Then we develop those um, contracts and then publish those contracts for small business exclusive bidding. And then we would also establish the standards for the large contracts and that would be written into the bid packet and into the contract that is a result of the bid packet award um, so that we have both the, the small business working as primes and the small businesses being subs to the you know $50 million schools that we're building. Other actions, um, we in our research we've determined that some of the barriers for successful implementation of bidding for small businesses is understanding what you know that scary 20 page bid packet that you have to submit. Um, so we anticipate having you know probably evening and weekend. We, we typically do several outreach programs. We want to increase that so that we can um, meet people where they are and educate them. You know, what does the debarment form mean? Form mean? And, and do you have to send this to an attorney to get it signed? Or is this, if we educate the community on what those forms are, then they would be less intimidated and then more likely to submit and submit a com correct packet for a bid response. Um, Can I well, ask a quick question sure. on that one? If someone submits one and there is something that's wrong, what happens? Is it just kicked out? Or what? It depends. It depends on what's wrong. Um, we legally we have guidelines for if it's a minimum requirement versus if it's a preferred statement versus you know. Um, so it depends. So and case law dictates if um, if this is an example. So if you forgot to submit your business license, right? We would give you an opportunity to say we reviewed your bid packet. We did not find it. Right. As long as it, and they submit it, you have 24 hours to submit it. If they submit it and it's dated before the bid was due, then it would be accepted. If it's dated a week after, it wouldn't be accepted and they would likely be disqualified. But it's a case-by-case -case basis. Do you provide them feedback then to say, you know, we asked for this, you provided this, you were missing this and this and this, and that's why it didn't go? Tracy, would you like to talk a little bit about vendor feedback? Sure, I will. Sure, I will. Okay, hold on a second. We're back on to the uh, issue. When we need to mute here so that you can um, speak. One second. Go ahead. No, you were Go ahead and mute, Sally. All right, go ahead. Try, Tracy. Okay. So, um, we have one. Can you Okay. We have language in our solicitation <laughs> that allow us to ask for information that may have been inadvertently omitted in the past. So, like Susan said, um, as an example, we would email a vendor and say, you know, the solicitation, the requirement was to submit your business license. Um, please submit your current business license within 24 hours to be um, further, further amount or um, for further um, review. So we do allow them, and the only thing that we don't allow them to submit after the fact is anything that had to be notarized because clearly, um, you know, if we ask them after the fact and it was notarized today, but it was due yesterday, that would not be allowed. 
Like so we do we do feedback to the vendors and let them know we we'll work with them if it is something that they that, that you know they just did not understand or that they clearly just forgot to submit. Okay. So Tracy, the question that he was asking about is after they have submitted a packet and they have not been successful, do they get a debrief? So if you could describe we can. If you could describe the opportunity for debriefing after uh, losing. <laughs> Did you hear that? She said, could you describe the opportunity for debriefing after they lose it? <laughs> We're not selected, that be nice. Yes, so um, yeah. right. for like a, re a request for qualifications where we're looking to hire um, an architect or a construction management firm or maybe a building official sometimes they will come back and they will ask us if they if we can debrief them and let them know how they can improve in the future um, since we've started doing that we have seen a tremendous improvement in the um, quality of the submittals that, that we are receiving and as an effect we are seeing some of those vendors who ask for debriefings who are at the very bottom rise to the top and they're actually getting work now so we have learned that education is key when it comes to um you know providing the community with information and and guidance and like susan said um educating them on how to submit a bid so that is one with this small business um, enterprise program that is one of the things that we have discussed is that you know, we can create this wonderful process, but if we don't educate the community and make them feel comfortable in submitting, then this is all for nothing. So that is definitely a huge part of this, in, in our opinion, is that once that this is implemented, that we would go out to the community, you know, and really dig deep and, and, and teach them and educate them and, uh, and work with them to show them how they can submit. But debriefings have been very, very beneficial, and that is um, an option that, that any member has um, if, they, if they reach out. It's, we also ask them to do public records requests. We look at that as a way that they can see what their competition did and what they did well and what they can do in the future. And since it's all public record, you know, all public, they, they can ask for that information. That has also been very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Um, Tracy, can you hear me? Okay, all right, so we're back. With that. Look at that, without a hitch. <laughs> all right, um, so an important part of this program will be to um, begin more stringently measuring um, the businesses that we're doing, that we're reaching, how many of them are small businesses, how many of them are minority, and if they're mar minority, into which category. So we anticipate um, requiring all of our vendors to register, um, to provide their registration information. The committee will decide if we're going to, and we would likely embrace existing state or county guidelines for the criteria. We, we are not going to be in the certification program process. We are going to be leveraging what others have done to uh, reuse those, those practices, um, get, have people certified elsewhere, and collect that information in our database so that um, then we can calculate how much of our uh, payments are going to um, small minority businesses. And over time, we will be able to measure that, monitor, and determine if there is a disconnect between the percentage of the community businesses that are minorities and the percentage of work going to minorities, at that point, we would probably conduct that disparity study to discern, determine if we could be more aggressive at minority awards instead of small only small business, which is a, a broader category um, of sure. awards. So data collection, metrics uh, collection and analysis will be important as we uh, launch the program so that we can monitor how we're doing and make changes to the program if required. Any questions or thoughts on that? That'd be good to put that in the budget book then as you get that in the next couple of years that, you know, of our contracts we awarded, we awarded, you know, $50 million in construction and $40 million in others. And of those, so much was small business, so much was minority, so much was women owned, you know, the whole bit. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's what 
you know, because that way you're showing the community you've listened. Mm -hmm. You know, you're reaching out, you you figured out what's, yeah. That's also a good one to put in our, uh, what's the, why people fold the uh, annual report, annual impact report. report. Okay. Mm -hmm. I knew it was going to be we knew what you were talking about. You knew what I did. As soon as I knew this. <laughs> I have a question. Have you looked at past, the past regarding um, involvement with um, The challenge we have with that is uh -huh. we have not been collecting the data. Oh, wow. So what we have done, though, over the past 10 years is we've evaluated, uh, like we pulled a county list of um, quali qualified, certified uh, minority businesses for the county. And a couple of years ago, we were using 80% of the firms on that, or they had been paid at some point or another in our system. So we have that to, to go off of, but what we need to do is have each vendor submit that information, start tracking certification, so that then we will be able to generate reports on spend. So a little bit loosey-goosey right now with the data that we have. So we need, we need to get those, those metrics um, captured so that we can actually make decisions on that data. data okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So here's our timeline for program implementation. <coughs> um, we're in the um, uh, July to October time frame of updating advisory committees and community organizations. Then we'll go to the policy and program implementation um, as long as the board you know recommends that we proceed our goal would be in the january time frame we've established the committee define the administrative procedures and we'd love to start identifying um, contracts for award um, by the june time frame um, for uh, small businesses i have a question um when they were setting up the audit, and correct me, guys, if I'm wrong, um, people on this advisory couldn't be on it, or they had to quit this one to be on it. Um, is that going to hold for this also? So the question is, is it exclusive to be on um, one or more committees? Well, that particular, because this, this particular not, one. To be the on, audit okay. one was was the only one that's not, you're not allowed to be on multiple ones. Mm -hmm. And the uh, project list one, or how to, how to spend the money coming out of the half cent. I saw so yeah. 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 mm -hmm. yeah. Didn't know what it was called, but I know what it is. <laughs> 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 yeah. Just yeah. do a, a thing and they'll know. Yeah. 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 I think, um, you know, that's primarily going to be up to the board. We have not outlined that in the draft policy that we have. So the draft policy that we have, um, we just wanted people that would be able to contribute based on their knowledge. And we don't necessarily feel like it creates any kind of uh, uh, conflict by being on necessarily more than one. But ultimately, it's the board's policy, so it'll be up to whatever um, they adopt. Don't everyone look at me at once. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you, you've heard a good broad overview of um, what our plan is, and we want to make sure that we um, have focused discussion on, um, we've identified some benefits of the program. What other benefits can you think of? Any hands raised online? <laughs> well, I'm so shy, I'm going to speak up again. <laughs> um, this might be a good time also to look at at things like, do we do it in-house or do we subcontract it or contract it out? And contract which, what, what else? Well, yeah, say mowing the grass. You know, do we need a leak district oh, okay. employee? You know, this, this, once yeah. we get to policy, like in the next, you know, two and a half, two years, whatever, when say, hey, we want to engage the community, you know, maybe that's the way to do it. And then, you know, just, I mean, because right now we haven't done any studies in a while, right? To say what should be done in house and what should be done, what should be contracted out, that's right? A, that's a different. No, that is, I, I, that's yeah. not. Understand. Um, that it's, is it, that is done actually when we go out to bid, we do an analysis to determine should this be in source or outsource. Okay. So and there has been ongoing um, effort to identify, um, you know, 
what is the cost for internally doing it versus externally doing it. So that is actually an ongoing and has been done multiple times and is looked at as we go out for each bid, uh, depending on what it is. If we're buying widgets, no, we don't look at that. Sure. But if we're mowing lawn, and, and we have looked at that, and we do have, we actually, we have a bid for mowing lawn at Alba and Pine Island. Okay. Guess why? <laughs> yeah. I mean, hard to reach, yeah. you know, easier for somebody right. who's out there, lower calls for them to right. do it, than for us to have somebody okay. put it on their trailer and haul it out there. Sure, thanks. Great idea, though. Um, another thought we had is what additional opportunities for community review do you recommend? So we've been to the Construction Advisory Committee, the Equity and Diversity Advisory Committee, this committee. We've gotten some names of, of community members. We reached out to City of Fort Myers because they have a well-established um, program. And so if you could give us input, then we'll be contacting folks so that we could find out who, who else can help us frame this as we move forward. Chambers. Maybe even FGCU, they, they've got a lot of stuff going on there. And, and I'm sure they have the same kind of discussions every day. Do we do it in-house? Do we contract it out? And, you know, if they've already got a policy, let's just, you know, change the header and let's let's go with it, you know. Uh, FSW the same way. Um, the other one doesn't have a real big campus. It's just got an office building, so. Right. You know. Yeah, so we're working with the RSW. Yeah. We are yeah. working with the Port Authority, with FGCU, with FSW, and the city, the cities. Are there any builders, uh, I mean, or business like uh, organizations? Like yes, for there's the BIA and or... the CC, there's the Building Industry mm -hmm. and the uh, Cape Coral Builders Industry Association. And we engage them when we have our open houses, but we have not submitted this policy to them. Um, we went to the Construction Advisory Committee, which is comprised of construction firms who uh, in the community, but I think that's a great idea, the BIA. Mm -hmm. Doesn't JA have a, a you know, non-college, non you know, recruiting day for all the things? Like they had one down at Dunbar a couple years ago where the city of Fort Myers came in, the Rumpke guys, um, Best Home mm -hmm. Services, all, all the rest of those. Okay. You know, those are all represent, you know, there, there must have been 25 there and the students had a break. They came down and they, they talked to each booth right. that maybe some of those people, if they're not in the B&I, but we've already got 20 of them or so captive. Mm -hmm. Hey, let's go out and talk to them. And that was the junior chief that you were saying? Yes. Okay. And I think you have some labor unions in, in this county um, and they are very involved with small businesses. What about the score? Score, S C O R E? Yes. yes, I think because that would be a good place to roll out, get their input, and also they could roll it out. Okay, and what, is that, what does that stand for? Society, uh, Society of Corps, Corps, Service Corps, Corps Retired Executives. Okay, I was familiar with that group. So, okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. And you know what? The, the good idea with that is they mentor people going into business. Mm -hmm. To be able to help them know how to go through this process and and maybe get some of the, uh, the jobs. Right. And your technical skills um, do a lot of uh, uh, placement and training with a lot of small businesses. Career skills? And career skills. Okay, okay. Yeah. And, and the difference of time, we still have one more section to go, and it's probably one that. I won't say it's controversial, but one that will generate a lot of conversation. So, well, I've got like a list of a whole bunch of, so we should just email you yes. or? Yes. Kelly, sure, yeah. Or, or questions and suggestions. Or no. and then to yeah, if you just and email me, email or you. Barb, we'll give the information to okay. Susan. And also, by this and time next week, yep. would you be open to a phone call? Absolutely. Right. I've actually, from other committees, I've already had several conversations with folks, so right. I just want to make sure that, you know, for this committee, we want to make sure that Kelly is aware of what's going on, but then yeah. um, Tracy, Amy, or I would be doing the follow-up calls. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you, ladies. I apologize for having to cut your show. No, no, no. I just didn't get to the questions. <laughs> <laughs> I think no, we had enough throughout. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, thanks for your time. It was good. Thank you all for sharing time with us. Really appreciate it. And thanks for volunteering here on the uh, Financial Advisory Committee. And I think it's great that you're doing this. Uh, I, I have heard criticism in the past that they only use the same people over and over. So I think it's great. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. And now on to the budget. Yes. <laughs> so, and, uh, you're staying. <laughs> <laughs> Don't run too fast. Thank you, everybody. Uh, <laughs> budget for 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really what I want to see. It's 525. I'm going to argue. Good job. I like that. Five minutes. Oh, <laughs> So um, I've given everybody that's here that wanted it a hard copy of the budget book. Um, for those of you that are on Zoom, it is online. We talked about that last week. But if you go to the district's webpage um, and you go to the bottom, there's a dollar sign. You click in there, you hit current um, budget, and it's right there. So you can get one. Um, you can look at it um, as well. That's our current budget book. Strangle you. I, I sent out to you all, um, Mark had sent me a, a list of questions, and I sent that out to you all, and I have the questions from last week that as we were going through some things, so I was just kind of going to hit some different spots and then open it up for questions. One of the first things this morning was timeline. On page 18 of the budget book itself, we put in the timeline of when we start the process, what each part of that process is, all the way up through the approval of the budget and the approval of our work plan that we have to do as well. So all of that information is there, but just to kind of give you a brief overview, we are constantly working on the budget. So everybody thinks that, you know, after the budget's approved, we're done. And that is not true. The, the budget is a constant, anybody that's ever worked with one, you know it's a constantly moving, ever-changing thing. So things happen, they come up, it changes, you're having to move around, figure out how to cover a cost for things. It is never done. We are always looking for ways to do it better and for places we can find savings and um, you know what kind of data should we be pulling and things like that. So anything you all have, we are very open and ready to hear it. Um, I will take nothing personal. Um, this is, um, you know what I say, it might be the director of budget. I have very little control over everything really that goes in there. There's a bunch of um, divisions and schools that have needs and so it's, it is a, a district budget it is not a budget department budget. This is not just put together from my department. It is everybody that gets in and, and has discussions and comes up with this. We start the process, actually start the following year's process. And I know when we were talking earlier, you all were talking May. We actually start the process in November. So in November, we start looking at what students are, have shown up? What do, what do we think we're going to get next year based on, based on our growth? Because as you know, we probably know, we are funded based on the students that we get in the district. And we are funded based on their exceptionality or their level of service. So you have your basic students, you have a K through three is funded at one level. You have your four through eight graders are funded at another level. And then you have your 9 through 12 that are funded at a the, the level there as well. Um, that they are based on cost factors. Your 4 to 8 is a cost factor of 1. So really you get funded for 1 for each of those. Elementary to K to 3 is a little bit higher. And then 9 to 12 is a little bit lower um, than, than the K to 3. Um, we also have our ESE population, which is our exceptional student education population. They are funded at a different level because you have to put more resources towards those students. They need a little bit more one-on-one -on -one attention, whether it be for gifted or if they have a learning disability or a physical um, disability. So those students take more. There may be a speech um, issue that you have to work with them a little bit closer. So each of those levels are provided an extra source of funding for it. It used to be that we would have a complete breakout of those um, things. 
at this point, the state, um, some years back, changed and said, okay, if you're just giving basic ESE services, if a student has just a slight learning disability and you're just putting a little bit more resources in the classroom with them, we're not gonna give you as much. They came up with what they call the ESE guarantee. So they took that student population and they kind of lump summed it together. And then they started just giving you a, like a little bit of a growth factor every year for that student population. So that's your basic, your speech, your, um, you know, your, your students that need just a little bit more assistance. And it's funded basically, you get funded based on the regular level of the student and then just a little bit extra through the ESE guarantee. Then you have your students that require a, little, a lot more um, service, more one-on-one -on -one type service, maybe not quite to 101, but a very small student to teacher ratio. They get weighted at a higher weight and paid at a higher weight. Um, I do have it somewhere here in the book. I just did not go through and look, but you'll see it says like 101, 102, 103, 111, 112. Those are your 254s and your 255s. They require a little bit more. So if um, we have some students, um, our life school students, so they need a little bit more attention. Their classes are smaller. They're more one-on-one. -on -one. We have assistance in those classrooms because one teacher can't handle eight to 10 students. So we put a teacher and an assistant in that classroom and they work with those students to provide more one-on-one -on -one services for them instead of being in a classroom of 18 to 20, 25 kids. They're in a classroom of eight to 10 kids depending on you know, their needs and they're provided um, an assistant to help that teacher in that classroom. So we are funded, um, our SAR ESOL population, um, we get a, a little bit of additional funding for our ESOL population because these students, as they're also trying to learn the curriculum, they're also trying to learn English. And so we get a little bit more funding to provide more assistance, so we will have ESOL assistance in there to try and help those students learn English while they're learning the curriculum at the same time. So, and we have a very high ESOL population here in Lee County. So um, that is one that, um, when I do my projections with the state, they always wanna lower that projection and I'm always having to say, nope, we need to jump that up and I have to show them the documentation of how our growth is in that area to get that number up. When we look at the students that we have, we look at the growth patterns that we have, we look at the, the newborns that, you know, how many they're gonna be here. And while newborn, the newborn uh, factor has a lot to do with it, in Lee County, most of our students come from outside of the county. So the, the, the um, birth rate, while it plays a part in it, isn't as much as in most counties because our population is coming from other places. If they aren't born here, they aren't raised here, they're coming from somewhere else to here. So while it has a factor in it, it's not one of the main factors that is looked at. So we look at what our history is, what we're doing, and then um, the state sends us what their projection is, and then we tweak it, and then we send it back with our reasons why we either agree or disagree, and they either accept it or they don't. Um, we, um, I just want to say, not to pat it, I have someone in my office who does it, she's very good at it, and most of the time we are more on than the state is with what our population, you know, with what our numbers are. Um, and so we're pretty good at it. Last year, I will say, we were all thrown for a loop with COVID that had a big part in it. Our numbers dropped immensely. So calculating for this year or projecting for this year was a little bit unusual for us because you know you look at history and you have one whole year that we just had to take out. Um, of the equation because it was just really hard. Um, we just had our first survey that was done last week and I'm happy to say our students are back and we are growing. Um, we had actually turned in a projection and the state came back and never before this happened and said, no, we think it's gonna be higher than that. So we're like, okay, I'll take them. <laughs> I didn't think we were gonna get that high. So um, as, you know, anybody who's been here before, you know I'm conservative. So I put money in the back of the budget to hold in a reserve in case the students didn't get here because after you do these counts, they if your kids, the students don't show up, they will cut your budget. And I don't wanna to go to a classroom and have to cut somewhere that's already been distributed. So I put a little in the back so I can pull that, 
when that happens and if that happens or if something else happens because you just didn't, never know what's going to happen. Um, and so I have that sitting back there. The numbers actually look very good right now. Um, we still have a couple of things, you know, the state has to go through and run some processes where they match our students against students in other districts and they run that whole process to see, but so far we look like we're on track to hit that. So we actually start that process in November, process in November. Um, we start talking to people about what their needs are, what, you know, where they think they're going to be, where are we going as a district, what the priorities are and start looking for that information on, you know, what is the focus going to be for the budget? Sorry, talking very fast. <laughs> um, during this time, we're starting to get calculations. So you'll see in this timeline, you'll see like the third calculation or the fourth calculation. So um, just to kind of make sure everybody is aware, we count students four times a year. So we count them in July. We count them in October. We count them in February, and we count them in June. The October and the February are the two that we are funded on. The only funded FTE in June and July are our DJJs. Our Department of Juvenile Justice programs are required 250-day programs, so we get funded for that 250 days, where the normal um, student will go 196 days, 190 days. <laughs> 190 days, I'm thinking teachers are working. Well, the students go 180, 180 days. 180 days. 180 days. So, um, and then the DJJ programs are 250 days, so we um, get paid for those for those other ones. We still report any students that we instruct over the summer, whether it's a it's a major district program that runs, which um, we are required to. Um, educate our third grade low performing readers so that they can get back on track and hopefully go on to fourth grade. Um, we run our summer programs um, because the loss of learning during the summer is really hard on some students. So we, um, we offer programs throughout the summer to keep kids learning throughout the summer to catch up on things that they may have missed during the year. Some of our schools run their own tutoring programs for their own students with funds that they get. And so we report all of that instruction to the state. The state tracks you know, how much instruction you're providing to students, whether you're getting paid for it or not. So we, re we report all that times. There's another survey, it is survey five. It is also done in June. And that's where we report the extra things for our students. So we report things like um, any student who took um, um, an advanced placement or an IB or an ACE course that pass the test, we get extra funding for those, the teachers are provided a bonus on those, and then the schools get money back so they can continue those programs and keep them going. They um, are more expensive programs to run, so that money goes back to the school so they can put it back into those programs. We also report our CAPE or our industry certification students, the ones that make it through those programs and get their certifications at that time. Same thing happens, teachers get bonuses the following year for teachers that or students who get through those programs and then the school gets that money back to keep those programs going. We report early graduating students and all kinds of stuff during that fifth survey. So those are the reporting times that we do to the state that all is put in together for our funding. So that's basically how we're funding. Then the state has the, um, the Florida Education Finance Program that they send out, which is basically Every district in the state, how much based on the calculation, because I've heard, I'm sure you've heard the base student allocation times the district cost differential. So you take your, your student count times the weight factor. The weight factor is what I was talking about before. If you're kindergarten through third grade, if you have ex, um, extra ESC services, they apply that weight factor to it. Then they, get, they apply the base student allocation. And then the district cost differential, which is the differential by district depending on the cost of living within that district. And that is your base allocation for your students. Then they start adding things on. Um, they'll add on like the ESC guarantee that we talked about, supplemental academic instruction. And in the back of the book, it goes through all of those pieces of it um, as well. There's a breakdown of all of the pieces that you know, make up that um, FEFP, 
And then when they get all done with that, sorry, my thing is up. When you get um, through all of that, then they look and they say, okay, because everybody now is funded equally based on your student population. And then they say, how much of the state state's going to pay versus how much your local district is going to pick up? So the higher your tax base, the higher amount that you're going to pick up through your local taxes. So that's, they then you know, do that. That's part of when um, we were talking earlier about the timeline in June. That is what's determined. They give us an estimate in May, but in June when the tax roll comes out and all that information comes out, that's when they tell us how much we are going to millage for our district. That becomes our local portion that goes towards the um, Florida Education Finance Program. And during, in that program, in the calculation, they only levy about 96% of the taxes because there's no guarantee we're going to collect 100% of the taxes. Um, people don't pay on time, things happen, so they set that at 96%, trying to assure that we get um, that money so that we're not undercut somewhere else as well. Who, who sets the millage rate? Um, the Department of Revenue gets the information on the tax rate, and then the um, Florida Department of Education, I believe, is the one who sets the millage rate. They're the ones that provide it to us. Okay. It's an impact that needs to figure in, or it's not strictly the capital. That, right? That's capital. That's a different process. Mm -hmm. Yes. So right now I'm talking about the operating budget process. Okay. Any questions so far? Everybody with me? Okay. Um, so after we go through, you know, all of that stuff, we get our numbers. Um, at the same time as all of that's going on with the state, we're working with departments. Um, we give our schools what we call DRAs. That's a district resource allocations. So um, what we do is we look at each school individually, and we say based on past experience, back, you know, past student populations, how many kids we think we have coming into the district. Um, what, what capacity does the school have? How many kids can they put in that school? Then we go around and school by school, we set um, an enrollment number for each of the schools. That's the numbers then, and we work with planning while we do this. So this is not just the budget department. Planning sits down because they work on capacities, they work on that stuff. So we go through and we go, okay, we have this many kids and this is how we're gonna spread them, this is what we're gonna do. We try not to affect one school too much from the previous year. So if they had seven kindergarten classes, we try and hold them at seven if we can. Um, if we need extras, we'll bump them up if they have the room. Um, we, we very seldom go down because we're a growing district. So normally it's a growth pattern that we're looking at. And we spread those kids all across all of our schools. Um, we only spread the kids to ours. We also do the same thing for our charter schools. We look at their, where they've been, and we set a number for them. We send it out to them, and we go, this is what we're estimating that we are going to have. They come back to us, and they say, yes, we agree. No, we agree. You know, no, that's too many. No, we have a growing program. We think we want you to you know, try and bump us up to this, and we go back and forth with them. Um, and then we come to a number by schools. And then we provide the allocation to the schools based on the students that they're receiving, the same way that we do it with the state, based on the student's exceptionality, based on all of that information, it goes out to the schools. So we know if a school has a special program, if they have a life skills class in that school, we work with ESC to determine where all of those programs are gonna be within our school. We fund them based on that as well. So we, we give them what we call a district resource allocation. And there, within that allocation, we have things that are set. They're fixed things. The principal is fixed. Every school has a principal. Every school has a secretary to the principal, right? Then we sit and we get in there and we say, okay, based on your student population, you need to have these items. And then we say the rest of it, you know, this is the number of teachers you need to have to meet the class size for your specific student population that's in there. And the, then the school goes through their um, amounts and they set the school, the, the budget up based on the way they believe they need to be set up. 
it comes back to my office once they do that. We make sure that we have all those minimum requirements. When we send that out, we have what we call min maxes, right? So you have to have a certain number of counselors in a school for the students. There are, you know, minimum and maximums. You can you can have one if you're this size, but you can have no more than four if you're this size or something like that. There's a minimum and a maximum that they must meet. And if anyone in any one of the schools wants to do something other than that, they can put it in their file, but then they have to turn around and put in what we call a waiver. They have to request to waive from the min max. And then we sit down with academic services and we go through those requests because I don't know, I'm not an academic person. I want to make sure we are meeting those students' needs. So mm -hmm. academic services is the one who knows what those students need. So they say, yes, they have it covered because they're doing this. We can approve that waiver or no, that needs to stay where it is. They need to go back and fix it. So we go back to the school and make those adjustments. We are constantly adjusting. Students change all throughout the year. I meet with academic services every week and when a school has a request they may have a higher ESOL population than what we thought they had or that thought they were going to get so they'll send in a request for us to relook at their ESOL population they feel like they need more services so at that time we'll pull numbers again we'll look at them we'll readjust we readjust the schools um, we um, send it out then we run the batch process with student enrollment once we run that batch process with student enrollment, we readjust because, you know, the parents have a choice. So we look to see, okay, where did they really go? Did they hit where we thought they were going to go or did they go somewhere else? We readjust. Do we need to add some here? Do we need to pull something here? And we start looking at that. We send that back out to the school based on your batch numbers. Here it is. Now we leave a little out there for growth because we know we're still going to grow. Um, our kindergarten population comes right before school starts, especially in the East Zone. They come right before school starts. So, um, especially this year, I had major empty kindergarten seats all over the district, especially in the East Zone, everywhere. Right now, I have very little kindergarten seats available. It's just because they all came at the very last minute and they came in. So we're trying to do a better job, too, of getting that word out to parents. You can get your first choice or a better seat for your child if you start, if you come earlier. Trying to figure out, we have schools sending stuff out when they have siblings, and we know they have kids, at, um, smaller children at home. They're trying to send out stuff so that we can touch those parents to let them know they really need to get in here sooner. Helps us with planning, helps us to, to know what we need to do. Um, all through the year, we look at those as we're going, but the major ones are right at batch. And then we look again at what we call day 10. After school starts, the 10th day of school, most of the kids that, because we roll the kids up. So if you're in fourth grade, we're going to roll you to fifth grade. And we're going to make an assumption that you're coming to fifth grade with us. We have some that choose not to. So we've already accounted for them out there. And so we look again at day 10 and we say, did all the kids show up that we thought were going to show up? And we look to see, and then we might make adjustments around depending on whether they did or they didn't show up. Um, if they showed up and we have growth somewhere, we may add something. If they just didn't show up, we may pull something or we may ask the school to realign. Okay, your fifth graders didn't show up, but you have a bunch of fourth graders. Can you move a teacher from fourth, fifth to fourth to kind of fill that gap? So we'll go through all of that information with them at that time. Um, and again, then all throughout the year, the schools put in requests if they need additional services or if they ask us to look at, at the numbers again, we'll be looking at them. Um, I'm trying to go through the processes here as we go back and forth. So um, after that goes on, we, we are also working with departments. So departments are coming in and we ask them to look at their budgets and tell us what they need for the following year. Um, we, my office will do what we call a three-year average. We look at the expenses that they've had over the last three years, and we give them a base based on that. Um, we try to know, to, um, my 
I have people over individual departments. They try to understand their departments and know if things are changing so that they can be proactive in that. And so um, we give that number to the departments and say, based on your three-year average, here's where we believe where you're going to be, what you're going to need. You need to let us know if there's going to be any changes. Are you starting any programs that we didn't know about that you're going to need extra funding for? Is there something else that's going to be happening? And then they put a request in to increase their budget. If they want to change their staffing, they have to do the same thing. They put in a request to make a change to their staff. Um, they may be starting something up or they may, you know, um, we have an influx of students. So student enrollment needs another enrollment specialist in order to enroll all these kids as they're coming in. So they'll ask for it at that time. We take all of the information, we compile it all once we get it, and we look at it in comparison to what we think our revenues are going to be. This, at the same time, we're estimating revenues, we're estimating fund balance, we're estimating all of these things that are coming in. And we look to see, are we over? Are we under? Where do we think we're going to be? I think one of the questions had to do with salaries and how we budget them. We budget our salaries on an average. So we assume we look at all of our teachers, we look at how much they totally make, how many there are, and we average that out so that we're budgeting on an average. The reason that we do that is because if I have a, um, a school with a more senior teacher, it's going to cost them more. And if I have schools with um, less senior teachers, it's not going to cost them as much to have that less senior teacher. I don't want my schools to feel any effect by the teacher they have in the classroom. I want them to be able to hire the teachers they need to hire for that classroom. So we base it on an average that takes that whole thing into the picture and put them in there. Mm -hmm. Is that on the authorized number of teachers or the assigned? It is based on actual teachers. Okay. So we have pulled the reports based on the actual teachers that we have at the time that I do it, and I run it like in November okay. for the following year, and it's based on the actual there teachers. There were, what, 300 or so teachers short, something like that, so you can't use the 12,000 number, you use the 11,700, okay. Yes. All right, and when you say departments, you're talking like guidance, physical education, all that, you're not talking about I'm talking maintenance. This, 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 yes, when I talk departments, and I'm glad you said that, I'm sorry, when I talk departments, I mean in this building, the maintenance department, the transportation department, those out places. But the school doesn't have any uh, they can't decide how much maintenance they're getting. That's decided centrally here. They get to decide on their custodial allocation. So okay. I give them an allocation for custodians based on the size of their school, their square footage, and the year of their school and things like that goes into that allocation. And they then, um, and I tell them how many we think it's going to take. Okay. And they can use that number. They can change one, they can change them into a site worker if they want to do mow their grass and stuff they can do that it, it goes into that allocation for them they are providing a they're provided a building supervisor and a head custodian along with their custodial allocation that they have to choose from so that includes like security um coaches all kinds of things so this so i just realized it's five minutes to six <laughs> Um, and I apologize, it's, we have a hard stop at six. Mm -hmm. uh, Kelly, can I suggest that maybe we roll this conversation to the next meeting? Sure, I'm okay if everybody else is. Uh, and if there's charts or something you can use as part of that, uh, but it speaks volumes that we're all so engrossed in it. I know. To switch <laughs> can I ask one more question before we go? I, I know I've hit more than my fair share. Is there a spend plan then by month of how much you're going to spend? No. Okay, so how do you know how much to borrow in bonds then? We borrow in our um, capital for our construction. It's based on the needs now. The, we will go out for what we call a TANS, a taxable um, note. If and, and I don't do that part. Our finance does it based on cash flow and based on current expenditures and what they believe our expenses are going to be based on where we are, they make a lot of Okay, so only on the capital side do you borrow money. You don't, 
the regular yeah. day-to-day operation, teacher salaries, all that. Okay. I'm only if we do upper tens, which we just um, went out per ten, which is for a short-term taxable uh, tax anticipation tax 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 um, in order to get us through because our big set of money comes in after taxes are collected in November. So Correct. if we don't think we can make it till November, right. we will go out for that short term um, by only Yeah, just you, you didn't have enough left over from the year before to get you through to the taxes. Yeah, our, our CDD has the same problem. Yeah, right. so that's, that's the one time we will. The rest of our borrowing is all done on the capital side. Okay. So... And so I will take this up at the next one. Do you like the level of detail I'm giving? Is it too much? I, I'm good with the level of detail. Are we okay? Yeah. Um, from my standpoint, it's probably a little bit more than what we need. It's it's important that we have some level of granularity. But while this is really interesting, obviously we lost track of time. <laughs> the, um, we probably need to stay a little bit higher and okay. deal with some of the issues. That maybe you have to address the tens uh, thing here a second ago. Okay. But, yes. uh, we'll have an opportunity to look at this too. Yes. And for those, anyone who's online, if you want the hard copy book, just email me and I'll have one out on the front desk with your name on it. If you would prefer to have the hard copy book to look at. Okay? Just wear your mask when you come in the building. <laughs> okay. okay. Kelly, I apologize for shutting you down. Um, two things left. One is um, the topics for the next meeting. Obviously, I pushed some of the budget discussion to the next meeting. We had several topics on the plate. Uh, Kelly, you were going to test and see what uh, we could bring forward. And uh, I guess the, the one question that, that's been raised is. Been, the name has been used four or five times today. We got uh, impact studies. Is there a possibility to get a presentation on that? Get some of us grounded on what they are. Impact fees and a mm -hmm. proportionate share. Okay. Um, we can talk about impact fees and uh, proportionate share. You're talking about the um, working with the county on the that. Right. So it, it, real quick on proportionate share. Lee County goes into a rich development, Verdana, out on East Corkscrew, and it's 5,000 homes on 2,500 acres. Mm -hmm. So the impact fees for the roads were 50 percent, wasn't enough. So Verdana said, I'll kick in four million dollars. So what the school has never done, school district as that I know of or in the past 20 years, in my mind, I think we could one day make a recommendation that if there's any development order coming through the district through their planning, that if it's over 500 acres, we try to work with the developer to get 60 acres for a school. And that's what proportionate share is. Because if that developer is building $400,000 or more homes, you know, a few more million dollars to him or her is nothing. And so they did it with all the developments out East Corkscrew to build Corkscrew Road. So it can be done. The district has just never done it. And the commissioners are not in the mood to raise the impact fees because that the builders are who funds their salaries. So proportionate share is working. It's in the Lee County um, what, program code. It's, it's, it's in there, it's just nobody's ever, it, I, I brought it up a few times, it's been up, brought up a few times at the board, but it's, um, I, I think it's something we could recommend once we understand it. And especially, I can tell you real quickly, as from my perspective, um, we had a presentation, and I can show you where that is, but it showed future schools where they would be built. And if you look at the chart uh, for East Zone 82, and the, the circle where the school would encompass covers a whole large area that is yet to be developed, but it's coming. It's on the books with the county. So in, in defense of that, we're looking to build schools for future uh, people coming in that are not here yet and and to balance that out so if you're going to place a you know 1200 homes here how many are going to need schools and why should those of us that are already here paying have paid taxes pay for people coming in to get a new school 
And you'll probably do better with the developers because it will enhance the community. Uh, absolutely. And you're it's not a win-win. And you're not going to do with right. the, right. County, the county itself. I know. Mm -hmm. I, I think we've got the perspective on the table. <laughs> is there anything for the good of work? Is Kelly, is it possible to bring that? I, I will talk to planning and see if they can come okay. and discuss that. Okay. I, I know I got said no more, but can, at least you said no more. <laughs> can, can we just get the number of acres required for each of the schools? Yep, I have one. Okay. okay. Can I you just so. email that to us? I can email Thanks. it to you. Yes. For the good of the order? Anything? I make a motion to adjourn. One second. Goodbye. Thank you very much. <laughs> and thank you, John. Thank yep. you all very much. Thanks. I lost control quickly. <laughs> You're done good. You did a good job. Thank you, Dean. Oh, thank you all. I appreciate you all. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I see it. I see it. Oh. <laughs> okay. You're welcome. Well, did you say you were from Virginia? No, I'm, I've am i lived here since 06. So that's quite a while, 15 years. I'm from the East Coast of Florida, so Palm Beach County. That's where I grew up. That was part of my area. Oh, really? You want name tags? Nice place. Yeah. When I was growing up, it wasn't as dense. Oh, yeah.